This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. Subscribe to Bloomberg Surveillance On Demand on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. And always on Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Short introduction here because every word matters. Jeffrey Yu joins us with BNY Mellon. Yes, off their 12 page uh, look see forward of 2024, but far more on where we are, the interdependencies of everything that we're doing right now. How is our stability, Jeff Yu, to get started? Are you worried about glide paths being stable forward, or is there instabilities, jump conditions out there? Um, actually, compared to um, a few months ago, you know, probably I am less worried about the instabilities. You, know, you look at how markets are reacting to geopolitics and other facets. Um, I think uh, things are being handled pretty well. I think we should be thankful. You know, there was a nice loosening in financial conditions over the last mm-hmm. few weeks. Now, some correction is needed. The question in the short term, the tactical play is, do you play the correction of the correction? That, I think, <laughs> is going to be something markets it, need to deal with. What's interesting here, Damien, is what I think doesn't matter because Damien Sassar is going, Tom, shut up. We got to talk to Jeff Yu about higher yields. <laughs> about real stuff. I mean, look, Jeff, you know, your eye flow macro investor themes piece is just, it's required reading for anybody in the market. But I'm looking at two two of your views here. The first being a view of the U.S. Treasury 10-year yield at 5% or higher. Obviously, that's a steeper curve. But more importantly to me, euro dollar down to parity before stabilizing. I mean, talk to us about that. That seems quite out of consensus. It is out of consensus, but if you look at what the euro um, curve is pricing right now, you know, surprisingly, so people ask me, okay, you see euro dollar at parity, do you see very aggressive um, ECB cuts? I say, well, yes, but relative to what markets have been pricing towards euro, and no, I thought markets were adequately priced. We were at like 150 basis points for the ECB. I thought that was perfectly fine, but right. if you believe it 150 basis points from the ECB, then what was euro dollar doing up here, right? <laughs> so I think that needs to be reconciled. Even if we meet halfway, I don't think parity actually is, a, uh, is, is quite a bold call at all. Well, let's put it this way. In FX, I mean, the big heavy lifting models, those, you know, relative value, those yield rate differential, relative rate differential models are doing a lot of the explaining in terms of, you know, how currencies have performed over the better part of not just the last year, but the last two years. Talk to us about carry in foreign exchange markets, Jeff. Is it still going to be the driver of performance? Um, in the short term, not really, I think, because things are starting to come off. You know, I look at our carry index. Are people buying LATAM? Not as much as last year. If I, uh, Are they buying Central and Eastern Europe? Yes, over the last month, but that's coming off as well. We saw the news out of Hungary this morning, however. But the dollar's role is very interesting. Yes. Last year, it was a carry currency. So you own dollar yield against <clears throat> CNY, against yen. But yeah. you fund it out of dollars against Brazilian real and Mexican peso. It was a funder and it was a carry name. This year, however, we think on balance, um, dollar strength, you know, it, again, it will depend on what you play against. You know, maybe Asia can come back a bit, um, but against the rest, like LATAM, for example, I think the dollar can actually hold well. Jeff, you on a strong dollar in a parity euro, what does that do to the stock market and particularly what does that do to the magnificent se- seven is long duration assets. Uh, well, I always say for the U.S., um, thankfully, especially for U.S. equity markets, you know, the lowest proportion of foreign earnings exposure compared to the rest of the major economies. Uh, so it shouldn't uh, worry uh, them too much. If there is a global demand story or an earnings story in, on the external side, what if China starts to export mm. deflation, disinflation again? That's well, where the earnings for U.S. tech will have to worry about. And that's a wheelhouse of Jeffrey Yu, mm. Damien, to talk about this this exporting of price change. That's exactly right. China. And it's the Asian currencies. I mean, all the talk this morning, Jeffrey, is about, you know, the dollar dominance and how it's triggering intervention fears across some of those more developed Asian markets. You know, I'm talking China, South Korea, Taiwan, and perhaps even Japan. I mean, talk to us about that. What what are your thoughts about official buying of, of currencies and equities in Asia? I think most Asian central banks are, you know, much uh, more um, uh, neutral these days. You know, they're happy to let the markets do its job. You know, they don't want misalignments. Um, if there's, um, there are moves, and it's always about pace. It's never really about levels, right? It's about pace. If it goes too much too soon, you've heard the Swiss National Bank and President you know, talk about this um, as well. So uh, they could start to push back a bit. Um, but the fact is, you know, China's uh, numbers, uh, the inflation numbers, they need a bit of a lift. And so the central bank you know, may say, oh, you know, on. a stronger dollar right now may not be a bad thing. 
in, in yeah. your your report, folks, we've protect the copyright yeah. of BNY Mellon. Go to BNY <laughs> Mellon to get the Jeffrey Yu <laughs> report with Mr. Savage. But 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 they, they're Damien. It's just simple. Three or five percent GDP growth in China. I right. Mean, that's the way Jeff cuts it. Well, I mean, Jeff, you know, you, the other thing I'm really curious to hear your thoughts about is geopolitical risk, right? I mean, if you just think about performance since Israel Hamas began in early October, I mean, we have equities up, we have oil down, spreads are tighter. I mean, we've been saying this over and over again. Does geopolitical risk even matter? And in an election year, I mean, forget about the U.S., we have a lot of other countries in an election year. I mean, I think two out of three um, individuals in the Democratic world are going to be voting for a new leader in 2020. How does that kind of resonate with you? I think it will always matter, but people want to wait these days rather than preempt um, policy outcomes, mm. right? It doesn't matter where you are. You want to just you know, look at policy proposals with a fine tooth comb and then identify what could be a risk. Um, if now there's a, um, a a sudden geopolitical event that comes through, we can deal with it accordingly. But the fact that we have been able to respond or markets have been able to respond in a much uh, more, I would say, calm manner, I think you can read this two ways. One, um, we have the tools available to deal with risks or is there still too much liquidity? And that's an argument, you know, for more financial conditions tightening right. is needed as well. Maybe the Fed needs to do more. Jeff, real quickly here. Are you worried about the United States ginormous debt? <laughs> so two things there. There is no replacement for the dollar's dominance you know, as the world's funding assets. You know, this has been talked about for 20 years. Is it going to be the RMB, the euro, yeah. uh, crypto? Thank the you. dollar's pres- prominence is not going to be challenged. Alternatives will always um, come through. So it's about a decline in share, but from a very high level. Um, so, yes, people will worry about that. We always ask the counter question, OK, we agree there is a risk. What is the alternative? And if there's still a lack of alternatives right. at this pace, I don't see that challenging the status quo. A briefing from Jeffrey. You terrific uh, kickoff report from BNY Mellon, Jeffrey. You there, uh, their lead strategist. This is a really important conversation, and it dovetails perfectly off his work. His incredible carefulness about measuring the American economy, Sri Kumar. Out on the left coast, just iconic at doing uh, this so well. And Sri, Bob Burgess, who's legendary at Bloomberg, Robert Burgess, driving all of our bond coverage for a year, had arguably could be the chart of the year in January. And basically, it shows the linear growth, the straight line growth of American retail. And then we enjoyed one, two, and the final Damien Sassar <laughs> stimulus and retail has boomed off the the projection, the trajectory that it was supposed to be on. Shri Kumar, is our GDP a fiction because we've got a consumer pop, as we saw yesterday in retail, simply because of the COVID stimulus? I think uh, Bob is correct in his analysis. It's a good one, Tom. And I would mention, yes, GDP growth, as well as the retail sales increase being so substantial, is a large measure due to both the fiscal and monetary stimulus that we have had. $900 billion in the final months of the the Trump administration and another $1.9 trillion in the initial months of the Biden administration. That is along with the Federal Reserve keeping zero interest rates much longer than the economic recovery required. And also the fact that the interest rates not only were kept zero, but the balance sheet was doubled from the beginning of 2020 to 2022. That's what you're seeing in consumer hands. More than $1 trillion of stimulus is estimated to be with them. And that is what is giving rise to what you see the postponement of the recession, Tom, rather than an abandonment right. of it. And that's how I'd put it. Forget about the parlor game of like what the Fed's going to do January, March, whenever the next meeting is. Out 24 months, Shri, 36 months where you really work. Are you optimistic our Federal Reserve can get us there with stability? I think the Fed, despite the Federal Reserve, we are going to get there to economic growth and we are going to get to recovery, that because the Federal Reserve is present, we are going to get there with a lot of volatility, a lot more than is needed. Example, you have Jerome Powell telling us in his December 13th press conference, essentially indicating the next move is downward 
and suggesting several rate cuts. The markets took off after his speech. Then we had people like John Williams of the New York Fed who had to do the cleanup act and essentially contradict the chairman. That provides volatility, but I think the U.S. economy is strong enough, as Bob mentioned in his article, that you really will have a good result two to three years I, from now, which the, is the time frame you suggested, Doc. I can't say enough, Damien, about how he, how Shri Kumar, as he always does, explains this. And this is Stiglitz 101, yes. in that all the worries out there, and Shri frames it beautifully, but if you have this miracle, which is American economic growth, it can solve the debt, the deficit problem. Sins of the Past by Sri Kumar. Sri, I have to ask you this. I read your work religiously. Um, you're talking about the mention of a slowing of QT and the read through into how that might mean that the Fed is mm, thinking about perhaps something breaking in the markets, a credit event, as opposed to, you know, PC below 2% is clearing the way for the Fed to cut. I mean, talk to us about that. What does that mean for financial markets and asset prices? Very timely question, Damien. Look back to September 2019. QT, or quantitative tightening, had been in effect for two years at that time. The Fed had been reducing its balance sheet from 2017 until September 2019. And was fine one fine day, the week of September 16th, the short-term interest rate shot up, as the Fed had not anticipated. So they had to give up on the quantitative tightening, switch over to provide liquidity in order to bring the interest rate down. We are, I think, in an exactly same situation today. We have quantitative tightening, which resumed in mid-March after the regional banking crisis. And having done that and reached where we are, Damien, yep. we are finding out that the amount of reserves in the hands of the banks the, res uh, the reverse repurchase agreements mm -hmm. have fallen off a cliff in the last few days. That is what I think the Fed is reacting to. That's where the Wall Street Journal article in the last yep. two days about the resumption of a slowdown of the QT is coming from. So, Sri, I just have to cut in here. I mean, let, so let me ask you this. Do we want something to break? Is that the way we get that Ed Yardeni 6,000 in the S&P only after something breaks? Or are we trying... To avoid that with a soft landing, I mean, what's better for the U.S. economy? Soft landing would be better for the U.S. economy, but I don't think you reach a 6,000 on the S&P without a breakage. First, <laughs> there it is. I agree completely, Sri, is, please. Oh, Sri, we've got to leave thank it. You, and, yeah. Thank you. And again, <clears throat> once something breaks, I would say you are in the September 2008 situation. Lehman Brothers has just gone bankrupt but the stock market continues to decline for the next three or four months. At the end of 2008, the Fed says they are going to increase the balance sheet, keep the interest rate at zero. Right. We reached the S&P 500 bottom in March of 2009. So wait for three months after a breakage, and then you will have the rally start again. Mm. Sri, thank you so much. Sri Kumar with us from Santa Monica. Thank you very uh, much. This morning, really, really appreciate it. Joining us now with PNC Bank with a look to your portfolio, Amanda Agati joins us, PNC's uh, the Chief Investment Officer, Asset Management. Amanda, thank you so much for joining today. I get the memo that 6040 worked last year. Can the theory of 6040 work in 2024? Well, uh, I'm delighted to be with both of you. By the way, I can't compete with those Pirates tickets, but I have Nittany Lion uh, football tickets. <laughs> so maybe we can go to a game sometime. I like that. Um, but to get, State yeah, college, to get, you know, there you go. There you go. We're going to have a big year next year. I have no doubt. Um, to get to your question, absolutely 6040 uh, will be alive and well in 2024. A lot of calls for the death of 6040 previously, and that was effectively the case um, when we were in a different interest rate, you know, regime and environment. But given all of the Fed policy action, given where yields are sitting today, it's breathing a lot of new life into fixed right. income markets. And so we do think that that 6040 right. portfolio does make a lot of sense, not for everybody, but certainly does make you, a sen you, make good sense in this environment. How do you at PNC take a measured approach when you see the growth, the revenue growth modeling 
of, say, Magnificent Seven or luxury goods. Richemont today out with a 9% pop in revenue, surprising with some good China uh, growth. What do you do with the super growers after a bang up year? Well, we're certainly not backing up the truck and adding to positions, but we're very grateful that we have had uh, pretty broad-based exposure to them. In addition to the rest of the market over the course of the rally last year, I do think though, given where valuations are, and even though the fundamental story continues to be pretty strong, we can't hang our hat on seven stocks to carry the day in 2024. And so we really need to see broader base reacceleration from the bottom 493. And so that's one of my biggest uh, wish list items uh, for 2024. We'll see whether uh, that uh, wish is delivered by the time we get to the end of the year. Amanda, you know I'm a fixed income guy, but we've had a lot of stock jocks on in the past few days, and they're talking about beats, beats over concerning as, uh, consensus estimates, how that's going to be a big driver of equity market performance. But what you write in your note here, it's not so much the beats, it's the misses. And I'd like you to expand on that a little bit. I mean, if you miss your earnings here in 2024, given this kind of positive undertone, the soft landing scenario that's being painted here, what do you think that will do to valuations and to, uh, and, and to total returns? Well, I think it's a challenging, if not fragile, environment that we start 2024 here with such a torrid rally and, you know, the lion's share of market returns last year being driven by valuation multiple expansion. We really need to see the earnings deliver to justify those valuations. And so... I think this is the scenario in particular here for Q4 earnings season where the misses um, can be pretty punishing. And so the beats or the inlines may be more muted in terms of reaction, but I think it's going to be a tough slog out there for those who miss, particularly given that we've had this really negative revisionary period. It was one of the worst right. in the last 10 years. And so the bar has been set lower from an earnings perspective, but that valuation story I think is you know going to be a tough one to achieve here with Q4 results. Yeah, and all the while we see the VIX involved just kind of hanging in here at some very low levels. I mean, what are your thoughts there? I mean, should we be buying protection? Should we be looking at options markets as a ways to hedge? The VIX has been in hibernation mode, uh, <laughs> certainly in a winter slumber here. I do think we're set for a bit of a resurgence in terms of volatility. Historically, though, I've been very focused on you know a higher volatility regime or high volatility yeah. regime. I'm not sure we're going to see that kind of environment here in 2024. I do right. think things are going to be choppy. The start of the year has been pretty choppy, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be an extreme volatility environment like what we've seen really since the onset of the pandemic. State the dynamic as yields come down of what all that cash does. We popped six trillion a couple of days ago in money market funds. It's a huge Pennsylvania heritage folks of money market development at Federated and at PNC is is well. If, if the yield comes down, what happens to our listeners portfolio? Well, I, I, I don't know that I'm particularly worried about yields coming down materially. There is quite a bit of cash sitting on the sidelines. I think a function of that is really uh, locking in many of the gains that we've enjoyed over the last you know year plus. And so I think there is definitely right. a yearning to put that capital to work again. Right. But I think it's really hard to pound the table and back up the truck right. here, given where equity valuations are. And so I think I would probably uh. see more room in fixed income markets for some of that cash to be put to work, even if yields do start to come down ever so slightly. Thank you so much, uh, I whatever it is, I 80 listening in Altoona, Pennsylvania, where the Pennsylvania Railroad makes that tight turn <laughs> with Mizzagati and Penn State football. Guy emails in from Altoona, Amanda, and he says, like, Franklin can't get it done in the <laughs> middle of the game. I mean, what do you do with your coach, James Franklin, with always, you know, game day coach and all that? I mean, where's the improvement got to be next year for the Nittany Lions? Oh, my God, that is such a horrible question to end <laughs> on here. I am not going to bet against Franklin. We've had just a tremendous recruiting uh, history here these last couple of years. And I think next year's our year. And so I'm not going to bet against him. Very I think good. it's going to be great. She, what's, we'll take the odds. It's like the Fed. Let's take the odds. You think Amanda Agati's going to come back again, Damien? You know, well, Franklin used to coach the uh, the Vanderbilt Commodores. He was, he was, Vanderbilt, he was a Vandy yeah, guy, you know. State I mean, we were, we were sorry to see him go. Yeah, James Franklin out of Penn State, Amanda Gotti, never to appear again. Amanda, thank you so much with PNC Bank.
Uh, this is a joy for a first conversation in 2024. In the backdrop here to talk to Margie Patel of All Spring is wonderful. Torsten Slock at Apollo out with a, a wonderful note, which I'm in very strong agreement on. And his question is, will 2024 be a repeat of 2023? I've been suggesting that that's an outside non-consensus call of the boredom. It will be just the same. Margie, after uh, the oddities of 2023, will this year be the same? No, I think it'll be a little different. I think the first half of the year will be choppy, probably down a bit. And after mid-year, the outlook for earnings will look better. And also the run-up of the presidential election, I think we'll have a rally in the second half and finish, uh, say, mid-single digits or low double digits. So a little different right. than the front. Let me get to the money question always with Margie Patel, and that's use of cash. Is dividend growth part of a good equity return this year? I think it'll still be that. I think the hurdle rate was treasuries where they are still favors um, stocks, especially those with a little bit of a dividend. Um, but at the end of the day, still we have to see earnings growth, not just the dividend. That's not going to carry a stock. So, Margie, we're looking for your S&P target for your... No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I would never ask you for your year-end target. But in, in seriousness, let's talk about some of the sectors within the S&P and which ones are projected to perform this year. I mean, energy stands out to me. Energy, you know, it's kind of been the laggard. If you look back to 2023, what's your thoughts on, on the outlook for energy? Do you think oil prices are going to be, uh, you know, skewed to the upside here? Uh, no, I'm not expecting a lot. I think energy is going to stay at a relatively lower trading range. I think there's some opportunities in the energy space. Um, we've seen some recent uh, M&A activity, and actually that's a pretty good indicator of what those in the industry see. <laughs> that says there's a little bit of optimism, especially because it's a sector that's really not very well liked here. Well, Mark, you mentioned M&A activity. You think it could be said for healthcare, right? Which I do know is one of your selected sectors. I mean, talk to us about where in healthcare investors want to position. Well, we think healthcare is still coming to the end of a period where all the macro things are pretty negative. Um, you know, pricing, COVID, drop off in demand from China and so forth. And we think that still has to play out a little bit before we see an uptick in earnings, which we don't think will really occur probably till next year. So we think there are a few opportunities. The problem with healthcare is a lot of the names are very highly priced right. for moderate. And then you still have some pitfalls like you see in the managed care today. Margie, as an amateur, I have a gut feeling that CFOs like lemmings off a cliff are going to go through a massive issuance this year. What is the underpinning of your call about issuance? How do you approach that? Well, when you look at, uh, at bonds, really, it's been pretty muted last year. And I think it's going to be pretty muted this year, if only because companies raise so much money during the period of zero interest rates, they really don't need to raise more cash sitting on their books. So we're not looking for any big uptick. I, and I don't think companies really have the uh, appetite to increase their leverage. Margie, one of the, when I think of Allspring, one of the things I often think of is your exposure internationally outside of U.S. dollar equities. I mean, talk to us about international equities, international fixed income. What, what are your thoughts there? I mean, what sort of you know, place does it have in a diversified portfolio? Well, we all have our biases, and I think we're all entitled to our biases. And my bias is U.S. is best. That's a country that I can understand that has the most transparency, um, the uh, most, the highest quality market. And uh, so I don't have a lot of interest in overseas, either emerging market or development. And honestly, you really don't see the higher growth rates that made those sectors supposedly attractive. So we think U.S. is best. You know, that's interesting because, you know, I was always trained that, you know, these emerging developing markets are going to grow at a faster pace. But I think we've turned that on its head in recent years. I agree with you completely, Margie. Talk to us about the growth differential between the U.S. and some of the other G10 economies. What are your thoughts there? Well, again, it's, it's pretty mixed. And really, I think overall, you're looking at pretty low, um, slightly negative to slightly positive. Uh, they have some of the same issues we did. They spent a lot during COVID. So they have a lot of influence to uh, that they have to do to cover the deficits of the, for deficit spending. And uh, particularly, we don't see a lot of avenues for accelerating growth because, again, we're not looking for China to have very, very high growth. The other emerging markets tied to China to also have growth. So it's really more very right. modest growth. 
Is cash an asset here? I mean, I keep asking this interview to interview. We have six trillion in cash on the sideline. Most of that's at Allspring, by the way, Damien. But we've got all the trillions of dollars of cash, Margie Patel. And to me, that is a Margie Patel opportunity. Where is the opportunity if yields come down? Uh, well, I'm not really looking for yields to come down. I think yields at four percentage in treasuries are, are pretty low. So we're not looking for a big rally there. Uh, I think that uh, high yield bonds continue to look relatively attractive in the investment in the uh, corporate bond space. You're looking at yields of say six and a half to seven and three quarters down from where they were, but still a pretty good premium over say 4%. And yeah. it's true. Uh, short term are high, but I don't think they're going to stay up to 5% for that much longer. Yeah, I mean, Damien, I use the WACC, the work weighted average cost of capital function in the Bloomberg. It's really, really lovely. I get a quick snapshot. I mean, Apple burdened with 4.4% debt. Are you Oof. kidding me? You know, this just in from one of our listeners in Red Bank, New Jersey, Anthony Young asking about the weighted average cost of capital for consumer staples, pretzels. Talk to us about, you know, the demand for pretzels. I mean, for consumer staples writ large across the whole of the U.S. economy, you know, is that a place we want to hide out here in the equity market? Well, I think it's actually an interesting safe space. Uh, those companies really did uh, very badly in the market last year, although their results were not terrible. So we see those as a uh, middle of the road opportunity, a, a place conservative, probably better than, uh, say, investment grade bonds, where you get, in most cases, a dividend. We already know the slower outlook for consumers, a little bit of pricing pressure. But, you know, altogether, I think that uh, with a dividend and a very modest growth, two, three, four percent in earnings will be enough to make them reasonable for a conservative investor. Margie, thank you so much. With Allspring, Margie Patel there. Subscribe to the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live every weekday starting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can watch us live on Bloomberg Television and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. Thanks for listening. I'm Tom Keen, and this is Bloomberg.